So for the next hour, we've got a really interesting group of people, CDOs of various cities, um, people from London, people from New York, and, and we're really talking about digital innovation for cities and what's happening in the cities. So like, like before, I love giving quirky facts about my speakers. And this next hour, the first 10 minutes, we have Catherine Oliver from Bloomberg Associates, and she'll give a presentation from there. And then Janet Coyle will actually moderate a panel from chief digital officers of various cities. And I'll let Janet introduce them. So quirky fact. First of all, Catherine Oliver is a true nylon. Do you know what that means? New York and London. She kind of lives life between the two. And her quirky fact is she was in the closing scene of the last episode of Gossip Girl. And she was in a movie, and I don't know if she was an extra, Catherine can sort of tell us that, but The Associate starring Whoopi Goldberg. So when she's not running, doing her role at Bloomberg Associates, she's a movie star, how fun. And then Janet, who's running the panel, the 50-minute panel with the CDOs and our city innovation experts, Janet, when she was 11, went traveling to Afghanistan, um, and that inspired her to join the Foreign Office. And now Janet actually works for London and & Partners and is very, very well known amongst our community and ecosystem here. So with that, I'm going to introduce Catherine to do a 10-minute presentation for us. Catherine, over to you. Can I leave this here? Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you uh, for all being here. I think uh, I'm just going to sit down. Um, yes, uh, nylon. Who knew? Uh, interesting fact. But I, um, I, w I lived in New York for um, uh, most of my life, and uh, but had the great pleasure of moving to London in 1996 and stayed here for six years, uh, working for Bloomberg, starting up the international television operations, and got my citizenship. So just as I was leaving, moving back to New York on the 4th of July, uh, the Home Office contacted me and um, advised that. Um, I could get a UK passport, so I was thrilled. So London is truly a second home, and it's great to participate in this event and see this whole neighborhood, which has been transformed since I lived here, which is really quite extraordinary. Um, I am a principal at Bloomberg Associates. So Bloomberg Associates is an international consultancy that was created by Mike Bloomberg. Um, as part of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Uh, as you well know, half of the world's population, more than half of the world's population, lives in cities. And Mike Bloomberg is a big believer in mayors and empowering mayors and helping them uh, to do more to improve the quality of lives of people around the world. And that's the mission of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, I served in the Bloomberg administration uh, for 12 years as the Commissioner of Media, Entertainment, and Tech. And I think I had one of the best jobs in government, and it enabled me to pursue my acting career and get a SAG card. So uh, that was exciting. But I was the film commissioner, uh, but also oversaw the city's public communications channels, and in the last term of the administration, created NYC Digital. Um, it was all part of economic development for the city of New York. Uh, clearly, when Mike Bloomberg became mayor of the city of New York, which was right after 9-11, the goal was, number one, to make the city safe, but it was also to diversify the city's economy and to find interesting ways to get people excited about living in and working in and building their businesses in the city of New York. And so we approached that by tapping into the entertainment and media sectors and also the technology sector. Um, we created the role of chief digital officer, we believe the first ever in city government anywhere, uh, at the beginning of the third term. And the vision there was really twofold. We wanted to explore how was the administration using technology to provide better services to constituents and visitors. So were our permits online? What did the website look like? 
social media was just beginning. How are we using that to scale messaging? And you know, working for someone like Mike Bloomberg, where if you can't measure it, you can't manage it philosophy, data collection was very, very important. So we created the role of chief digital officer. Um, and the, the other mission was to also work with entrepreneurs and to really understand how we could build up the tech sector in New York City. Um, it was after the financial crisis in 2008, so the banking industry was really challenged in New York, um, and so we needed to look at new businesses and to really imagine where the future was going. And clearly technology, people were using technology more and more, and uh, our competition was Silicon Valley, but we saw that we had a great opportunity to uh, build businesses in New York and, and really be um, a partner for the rest of Europe and a gateway to the United States. Um, and so we hired a young woman from the startup community. She had no government experience, but she um, had a citizen journalism platform. Um, so she had an appreciation of a sense of community. And we wanted to hire a young woman to send out a message uh, because when we looked at the tech sector, uh, you know, with all due respect, it was very white and very male. And we really wanted to send an image that this administration really wanted to help um, a very diverse cross-section of entrepreneurs and leaders. And so um, we tasked the chief digital officer, Rachel Hout, uh, with doing a listening tour, because we said we don't want to, we want to really understand this is a new role, but we want to really establish what's being done already and what does the city want. So she went on a 90-day listening tour talking to people within city government, but also in the community and businesses, and created the first digital roadmap for the city. And then we updated that digital roadmap each year, and it was sort of a report card, if you will, um, which really looked at um, the goals and what was needed and what we accomplished. Um, and from there, you know, we created advisory councils. Uh, we launched a, a marketing and media campaign, which was um, branded as Made in New York, um, because we really found that the startup community had a lot of local pride. And uh, we wanted to really recognize them that they were homegrown and they were really thriving in the city of New York. So the Made in New York movement began and was really embraced by the tech sector. Um, at the end of the administration, we moved over to Bloomberg Philanthropies and started Bloomberg Associates. And uh, one of the first cities that we started consulting with was Rio de Janeiro. And we had known Mayor Pius, and we knew the chief digital officer from Rio, uh, because he had come to uh, New York um, and to work with Rachel and to really understand what we were doing in New York. So we were really proud to work with the team there and it was just before the Olympics were going to Rio and again uh, there was a roadmap um, and very specific interests because the city was gearing up for the Olympic Games. Um, but the creativity of Rio was just uh, incredible. Um, they were really challenged and the mayor got a lot of you know, flack for hosting the Olympics, um, but they decided to create and have some fun with it and say, well, why is Rio hosting the Olympics? And so they created, they actually hired a stand-up comic, um, Explicador, who did a series of videos that they pushed out on the city's social media channels to explain why the hell is Rio hosting the Olympics? Why are streets being shut down and traffic, if you've ever been to Rio, is, is a nightmare? Um, and they had fun with it. And it was really to the credit of the mayor for having the courage and the creativity to support this. But it was really, it came down to the creativity of the chief digital officer and the communications team to explore how they could use social media, film, to really share messaging and have some fun with it and create a creative campaign. Um, we then went on to Athens, Greece, and we thought, wow, we're, you know, we're really challenged there. Um, Mayor Kaminis, um, the economy was on shaky ground in Athens. It has improved considerably, but um, 
you know, the financial struggles in Greece overall and specifically in Athens were great, but they had a young creative sector and the mayor's vision was to embrace the technology sector. And so we appointed a first ever chief digital officer in Athens and then he again did a digital roadmap. We went on to create a tech council and um, Athens has really thrived. Um, so much so that they were the winner of an EU uh, ch championship last year and got a million euro prize for the innovation in that city. But it all went back to the vision of a mayor and the creativity and commitment of a chief digital officer to connect with constituents, academics, and businesses to thrive. And in just a moment, you're gonna meet Theo Blackwell. Many of you probably know who he is. We've had the great pleasure of working in London and, um, and, and, and so proud that Mayor Khan has embraced this concept and created the role of chief digital officer for London. Is the microphone working? Absolutely. What a great story, okay. I love it. Pioneer of CDOs worldwide. So with that, we're gonna get New York, Barcelona, or Barcelona, and London on stage, moderated by Janet. So panelists, can I please get you to come out here? And I'm sure they'll have some very interesting facts to talk us through. Oops. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. A nice sunny day in London today. So uh, thanks to COGX for having us and for staging this most incredible venue. I feel really, really lucky um, to be moderating this panel in such a cool venue. I think London, you've probably heard London Fashion Week use this. Um, so at the end, we'll be having you walk down the panel. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thanks for joining us today, um, and thanks Catherine for that fantastic sort of context setting really about just about the importance of technology and, and cities. I think everybody here probably agrees that you know how cities are really adapting to technology is going to really sort of determine how successful they are. Um, so it's such an important topic in so many different areas. Um, so thrilled to have Francesca with us today from Barcelona. Um, now, Francesca is an Italian um, technologist, but also an advisor on digital strategy, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about what Francesca's doing, not just in Barcelona, but also more broadly in what she's doing to sort of collaborate many, many cities. Theo Blackwell, um, who's our chief digital officer in London. Many of you know, may, may know Theo. Um, he plays a real leading role uh, for London at the mayor's office and much broader um, across the London boroughs. Um, he's really ensuring that the capital status as a global tech hub is transforming the way our public services are designed. Um, and Anna Arino, welcome. Flo flew in this morning from New York um, as executive vice president and chief strategy officer is responsible for the development and implementation of many initiatives um, for the strategic direction in New York. I was there recently and I was quite struck with what they're doing, particularly in cyber and AI and a lot of the, the topics that we're hearing about this week. Um, so, so given, I think with technology, um, as well as opportunities, there's also many, many challenges that we're all very much aware of. Um, with cyber, with the effect that cyber security is having, uh, whether it's attracting the right talent in cities, whether there's you know, ado adoption by the citizens, there's so many, it must be such interesting work for all of you. And I know, Catherine, you have a very sort of global perspective on this with all the work you're doing with Bloomberg. Um, so I think what I'd really like to do is just kick off, I don't think there's one size fits all for any city, or I'd be very surprised if there was. Um, so just to kick off the conversation, I'd love to hear from each of you of what you're focusing on right now, because I'm sure there's many, many things, but if you could just share with us, you know, how you are looking to transform your city with the technologies. Um, Anna, do you want to kick off from a sure. general perspective? <clears throat> I'd be happy to, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to, to be back in London. Um, so, you know, from a New York City perspective, I would say the, the top thing we're focusing on right now is addressing inequality. 
my focus is on economic development and having a good paying job is the best safeguard really to address poverty. So technology has played a huge role in New York in growing and um, strengthening the economy over the last decade. I would say, you know, it has surprised many, I think reinventing it, the city has surprised many reinventing itself from a financial services economy to uh, an innovation economy, we're now the second largest entrepreneurial ecosystem in the world. And so we have the big guys, and you know, most recently Google announced they're doubling their, their workforce in New York to 14,000 employees. And we have the little guys. There's about 9,000 startups in New York, which is closed last year with $13.4 billion in, in venture capital. So by many measures, uh, we are living an unprecedented moment of success in technology and the economy overall. And yet many people are, are being left behind. And this is a problem. It's a problem, particularly in a city like New York um, of 8.6 million people where there's about 3 million of them that are foreign born and that are immigrants. Yeah. And so it's funny because for a long time we were thinking, you know, how can we replicate what Silicon Valley has done? They have, you know, 40, 50 years ahead of us when it comes to innovation. And today we are thinking, how can we learn from their mistakes and not become, you know, a largely homogeneous tech sector and how can we diversify the workforce? Um, you know, there's a lot that's happened in, in the last year that has, I uh, think, made tech not... Uh, very popular among some, you know, some communities. And for tech to continue to succeed in New York, we, I, we really think that people need to see themselves in those jobs. And so we're making a lot of investments to you know, lift people up and create pathways of opportunities for those. And cybersecurity is one of those areas. Okay, brilliant. So, it's, so your focus is very much on, on the tech ecosystem and really supporting those entrepreneurs yes. to actually get the investment yes. um, and make sure it's inclusive and the ecosystem's a bit more diverse than it has been. That's right, and, and, and like I think maybe the, the Theo's role, which is focused on innovating within government, yeah. uh, my job yeah, is different. how do we innovate uh, in industry? Yeah, so we're doing very similar things at London and Partners, so it's fantastic to hear what you're doing in New York. So thank you, Anna. And Francesca from, yes, from Barcelona. Barcelona. Sunny Barcelona, I think. <laughs> Sunny London today, yeah? Yes, yes. I brought it here. You yeah, did. A bit of London, Thank you a for bit that. Of Barcelona yeah. here. So, yes, I think our focus is really to take back the city for the people. So I think I was lucky enough to come to Barcelona. I was nominated by the mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau. She's the first um, uh, female uh, mayor in Barcelona. Feminist, ecologist, yep. uh, very much on kind of new democracy movement that she built in the city. And she called me up and the brief was, uh, I was in London at that point, I was working for Nesta, the UK innovation agency that you may know. Yep. And my brief was, can you use technology and data to serve citizens? So she really wanted to change the smart city agenda and instead of starting from technology, so instead yep. of starting from connectivity, sensors, big data, AI, whatever, she wanted to start from why do we need a smart city? What kind of problems we are trying to solve? And can we get citizen engagement at a large scale so that we can build a city that is better for people? So what we've done, I think I was lucky enough to come to a city that invested in infrastructures for many years. Yeah. So Barcelona has a seven, um, 700 kilometers of public fiber. On top of that, we built a pervasive IoT infrastructure that's open source and that's open standards. And we have a data infrastructure Structure that, that's pretty stable with a common ontology. We're building decentralized data architectures yeah. uh, to govern data uh, for citizens. So I think we started in a point where Barcelona had already built a real uh, good and solid you know, city infrastructure. But what we were missing was engaging citizens and starting from what they really care. So we started from affordable housing, uh, energy transition, and the fight against climate change is yeah. one uh, like our top priority. 
actually all the public vehicles in Barcelona are electric at the moment, and we are really investing public and private resources into having more uh, electric recharges uh, around the city. We built three times public uh, bicycle lanes so that we can have lots of bicycles around the city, more public buses, and we have a hub for the future mobility. So Barcelona is now the European hub for future mobility, where we're experimenting future mobility solutions. And then uh, the energy transition. So we're building a public uh, company to produce solar energy. And then we're working with cooperative startups, um, people that have good ideas that can plug in and create green um, and clean energy for the city. And so we basically want to move, uh, we, I think the, the advantage of cities at the moment is that they can become, of course, if only networked and they work together, yeah. they can become a laboratory for democratic and sustainable alternatives. I think in a moment where nation states seem a bit, you know, distant from what people really need and people don't trust anymore the political system for obvious reasons. And so what we are doing is start in reshaping the relationship between citizens and governments. And so we built a large scale participatory democracy movement. It's a hybrid on of online democracy and offline democracy. We use this in platform, it's open source, it's secure, it's decentralized. Okay. People own their data and their infrastructure and 400,000 citizens participated into creating the Barcelona City Agenda. So I think yeah, for no. us, this is a great success. Fantastic. So much, and huge focus on climate change, yeah. which is really you know, <coughs> brilliant for many cities to probably learn from. And you really set that infrastructure probably before you took on that role. Barcelona as a city um, probably took the right steps in setting the infrastructure, because I know that's something that Theo's been doing in your sort of, in the first chapter, if you like, of your new role in, uh, well, it's not new role anymore, but Theo, can you sort of share sure. with us today a little bit about how you've been building that infrastructure yeah. and architecture? So, so London's really big challenge is that in the middle of the next decade, we'll have the largest population we've ever had as a city, surpassing the Victorian times. Um, and by the middle of the century, yeah. we will have 11 million people, so an extra 2 million people living in this city. And as we all know, Londoners know that building infrastructure is difficult, building housing is contested, congestion um, is uh, bad in many areas, and we need to find ways to solve it. And London's federated structure across 32 boroughs, like 90% of our roads are run by different boroughs, 10% mm. by Transport for London, is that it poses Gosh. us a kind of, in, you know, it poses us a, a kind of digital governance challenge of like, if we're going to mobilize technology for public good, yeah. how do we get the right kind of infrastructure and thinking and collaboration in place so we can be greater than the sum of our parts? I mean, each of London's boroughs, which deliver many public services to people, have their own innovation track record. And many of them are really strong and many of them have got the hunger for more transformation. Mm. Our job is to try and harness that in a way that we haven't done before. So the, the kind of exam question set to us was slightly different to the one set to uh, New York and, and Barcelona it, in the sense that we're kind of dealing with slightly different structures. Having said that, I mean, it's been my pleasure through the support of Bloomberg Associates to meet CDOs from other cities across the world. And the funny thing is that we all face the same challenge, whether it's dealing with, you know, kind of Bexley and Camden and Havering all at once, or it's dealing with big city departments who've got their own culture and way of doing things, that collaboration between public services and engaging with the wider ecosystem, the government agencies, the universities, the tech yeah. uh, uh, sector around us, is all the same question. It just manifests itself, I think, in slightly different ways. Or slightly, yeah, different areas of focus or right. priorities. Do you feel when each of you took on your roles, and you might have a perspective more globally on this, Catherine, is it, is it a case of communicating expectations in a way or managing expectations? Because I know when Theo was appointed, the whole tech ecosystem was like, oh, fantastic, we've been waiting, waiting for this person for years. And I think there was this sort of expectation that you were going to help entrepreneurs get access to all these amazing opportunities. But actually, you've got a much bigger role and a more strategic role for the city in terms of that building that long-term infrastructure. Well, I think 
where, I mean, it's interesting what you were talking about, Francesca, of like building those kind of foundations for future civic innovation, mm -hmm. the direction of your mayor and the objectives there. I think the first task for us in London, I mean, there's a great track record. Uh, TFL's open mm -hmm. data kind of practically catapulted yes. London into the kind of category of one of the smartest cities in the world because we were able to build City Mapper and loads of applications mm -hmm. on the back of that. That was really good basic open data infrastructure. Yes. I say basic, it's quite complex, but it was like, it was a good move. The question for us is how do we build our common capabilities? Data sharing, championing design, that fiber infrastructure for mm -hmm. us to be more connected, investing in digital skills, and the kind of new mm -hmm. institutions that we need to collaborate. All of those things I see as quite fundamental capabilities that we need to refocus on. And I'll tell you what, it's, when you look at it from a city perspective, it seems to be completely vital. But when I talk to like someone who runs a large company, yeah. it's exactly the, the same. same things that they're yeah. concentrating they're on as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's important that cities have a chief digital and innovation officer, and now also a chief data officer. So I appointed a chief data officer, actually the first in Southern Europe. And now, but the most important is not only the roles, is that there is public investment in the team Teams, yeah. public investment uh, in the budget that we have at our disposal to do things, and then investment into capabilities creation, education, and skills. And so, you know, for instance, the technology company in Barcelona is 300 people. We hired 65 in the last two years because we knew that we had a big challenge and we needed people with new digital skills that could come and work with us and, you know, help us to collaborate with the ecosystem. And then the chief data officer today has 40 people working in a department where then they can partner with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which has now received the pre exascale one of the biggest <coughs> supercomputing in the world, and they have data uh, analytics capabilities, and they can help cities to achieve the challenges. But if we don't invest in infrastructure, in yeah. services, in people, in training, in all of this, it's impossible to do it. I mean, Theo could be the greatest uh, CDO in the world, but he cannot achieve. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's also important for the um, agencies or the, the, the mayor's offices to have a strategy on marketing and communications, because no matter how innovative you are in London and Barcelona, if you can't share that information, you know, no one's going to know. You need to educate people about the investment that you're making in the city, the training that you're doing. You're doing an educational initiative, creating a pipeline yeah. for the next generation of jobs. It has to go hand in hand with marketing and, and promoting that messaging. And so a lot of the work that we're doing as we go from city to city is now spending time with the communications managers, the marketing directors, to make sure that they're working very closely with the chief digital officers, the chief data officers, to just tell a better story to constituents. Are there any other cities around the world, Catherine, where you see they're actually getting it right and they're slightly oh, further I mean, ahead? Or? There are scores of them. I mean, you know, I think that London and Barcelona, you know, are doing an amazing job. And I think the wonderful thing for us is that we're now learning. When we go out, we're not saying, well, just because it worked in New York, it's going to work in Kansas City or Houston or Madrid. I think we're saying we worked in government. We found this to be effective. It's very important to create those public-private partnerships because you can't afford to do it on your own. The Technology is changing so quickly, you need to have that input yep. from the tech sector, both the big guys and the startup community. Um, but I think that there are scores of cities, and that's uh, oh, the, the interesting thing for us now is that we're trying to convene and bring people together uh, to learn the best practices. Last year, we launched something called City Tools, which we surveyed 22 international cities about what technology they were using, what social media platforms they were using, just to have a bird's eye view into where were we in 2018. We're going to be expanding that study this year and, and making it public. But at the end of the day, it really is learning about best practices, sharing ideas, because when we go to other cities now, they want to hear what's London doing, what's Barcelona doing. It's, it's human nature. How much is it, truthfully, like this little bit of a race to be that 
you know, the smartest city on the planet or the one that's driving innovation the fastest? Or do you feel that collaboration is actually at the heart of everything you're doing? I, I, I can start. Um, I think collaboration is definitely at the heart of, of everything we do. Um, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? You want to take yeah. what works and then adapt it to the local circumstances. Um, it was funny, you know, backstage, we were just kind of finding out that Theo was born in New York, but lives in London and works yeah. in London. I was born in Spain where Bria works, uh, but I, I, I'm now in New York. And I'm Italian. And she's Italian, right? So talent <laughs> is also increasingly globalized. And in that way, it's just so natural to work together because the leaders are global and the teams are, are global. And so in that way, I think it facilitates things. Uh, but, um, you know, we, have a, we ha currently have a, a new collaboration that we launched that is, uh, is in the process of unfolding that is, that is really successful that I, that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, and uh, we, we're partnering with London on that as an example. So, uh, you know, we're spending a lot of time in cybersecurity, as you kind of mentioned at the beginning, because they're, from an economic development perspective, is a is a win-win-win situation. Uh, we want our companies to be resilient, uh, protect their bottom lines. We want our citizens to be resilient. There's an insatiable demand for cybersecurity jobs, so on and so forth. While we were making these investments through public-private partnerships in innovation and talent, uh, we realized, you know, small businesses, there's 240,000 of them in New York City, and they don't have the sophistication or the resources to really adopt and protect themselves from, from cyber attacks. And so we issued this global challenge uh, called the NYCX Moonshot Challenge that was calling for industry around the globe to propose solutions that would be affordable and efficient for small businesses to really make them resilient. Um, that's, a, uh, that's a program that we have partnered on with uh, eight other cities and, um, and countries around the world, and it's been incredibly successful because what we are offering companies through that program is not only a million dollars in, uh, up to a million dollars in investment in partnership with uh, Jerusalem Venture Partners, which is a leading cybersecurity VC, but also the opportunity to expand not just to New York, to, but to all of the countries that are participating in the challenge who are offering uh, landing packages for companies that want to deploy their solutions abroad. Um, so we received those, you know, that, part, that global partnership has been tremendously effective. We received, um, you know, over 150 applications from 77 cities, 18 countries. 45% of those companies are looking to expand abroad. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's been really, really, really great, and it's a win-win for everybody involved. No, I love that project. And for those of you who are entrepreneurs looking to expand internationally, you know, these are great initiatives to sort of not just have a soft landing in New York, but have real business opportunities. So, you know, we're happy to connect you to some of those. We're working very closely with your team and credit to you. I think it's brilliant to open that up more globally. And I, 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 I would be remiss not to say that London and Partners has been such a critical partner in facilitating this initiative. And uh, it is not the first and won't be the last time we partner with, with London. So, uh, you know, to your point on whether we're competing versus collaborating, I think there's a very close Can I make a joke? Yeah. <gasps> joke? <laughs> yeah, of course you can. We want to compete with London. So now that you have Brexit, you can come to Barcelona. Ah. Sunny. <laughs> Sunny, there is the sea, it's very nice. <laughs> so you're welcome. If you want to do tech for good, Barcelona is your city. Yeah, we've, got, <laughs> we've got a room of entrepreneurs who are working through scaling their businesses. Anyway, nice joke. Um, <laughs> I wanted to move on to Francesca, though, because um, we hear a lot about AI around the conference of COGX and ethics. I know there's another ethics stage just down the road there. But it's, I think as we're building these fantastic new initiatives in all these cities, it's, you know, how do we engage the communities? How do we get that balance of ethics right? And uh, Barcelona have been doing some fantastic work and they've created this Cities Coalition for Digital Rights. Yeah. 
And that's really collaborating with about 40 cities? Yes, at the moment. Because actually we launched it with New York City and Amsterdam. We okay. were the three cities that started this coalition. And now UN Habitat is part of the coalition, so it's helping us to make it global, to involve also the global south, Latin America, many different cities. London is part of it and uh, over 40 cities. But we want to reach 100 cities in the next couple of months or something <laughs> like that. And basically, well, our, our point was uh, we have to start building the uh, digital society of the future, starting uh, with citizens' fundamental rights. And also because we saw, I mean, that lack of trust that I was speaking at the beginning, and also people are very worried about their data sovereignty, the lack of privacy, uh, the question that they don't know who to trust. Um, I mean, not, not in the digital society, but also in the relationship with government. Now at the moment that we are digitalizing all the services, they also don't trust the big corporations because of the um, privacy concerns, civil liberties, data breaches, and data man manipulation. And so basically we started doing this coalition where we have some principles, really high level, and we say, okay, we're going to start our digital city strategy, but we start from basic principles about ethics, security, security and privacy by design, yeah. uh, data sovereignty, so we want to give back the control of data to citizens, and we want to guarantee that there is accountability and transparency in the way that everybody is accessing data. Um, we also talk about diversity and uh, digital democracy and participation and digital skills. So we have really these high-level principles and then cities are coming together to create a shared roadmap and we are implementing these ideas together. So, so how, everybody's how doing do different you, projects. Well, I mean, we, we have, we have now we haven't formalized like all these big structures as an organization because we, we think that, you know, cities have already the structure. I mean, we are uh, cities. And so what we do is we have the UN Habitat, which is facilitating this kind of interaction Interaction, and we, we have shared uh, projects that we're doing. For instance, I mean, Barcelona has, we, uh, we have created um, our ethical digital standards for cities. We talk about how to improve public procurement so that small companies can work with the city hall. Um, we talk about how to use open source software, open yeah. standards, and interoperability. Uh, we, I mean, we are learning, we, we have built an um, ethical and responsible AI strategy. We are learning from each other. All, everything we're doing is in a free software platform. It links to GitHub. Other cities can take it on and can adapt okay. and copy and change and make it their own. So this is like a first start. And then of course we are, I mean, cities are now working mm -hmm. open source. So for instance, in Barcelona, the IoT network is open standards. It's reused in Dubai, Helsinki, and all around the world. Our democracy platform is free software. It's used by over 60 cities around the world. Fantastic. Data sovereignty, we build a blockchain with like encryption on top. It's called Decode Project. People are, like Amsterdam is using the same technology. So we can collaborate, we can reuse, and we can scale solution across the globe. Well, I mean, this is absolutely important because, I mean, at the end of the day, there is not only Uber and Airbnb and the big companies. Of course, we can create a big platform also for startups and innovators yeah. and people that have good idea, plug in the city infrastructure and create next generation technology for concrete problems, for the public good. So this is, I think, a huge opportunity. I think Sophia, from a, are we using this from a London perspective? Well, but I, I mean, we are a member of the cities for digital rights, but when you started off talking about smart cities, I think what's really interesting about this coalition of cities coming together is that we're not dominated by that kind of overarching narrative of like, this is what's happening in Toronto or in the <laughs> Middle East or in some city in China, you yeah. know, it's, uh, which is, you know, the use of technology towards a certain objective. As European cities, um, and you know, also joined by New York and others, we're taking a different approach, saying, okay, well, what's the role of the citizen? They must be central to all of this. So let's yeah. rework that discussion around smart cities. I mean, I've always seen it as a sort of adjective rather than a noun, if you like. Yeah. You know, let's talk about how we, you know, it's not just for company, big companies and their relationship with customers and third parties the, this, uh, around technology. It's about how technology is used for the citizens. So that's really important. I just say that the discussion that cities need to have as the custodians and collectors and administrators of data, which in a sense they always have been, you know, part of the reason why cities were created is really important. 
And when I refer, we started that discussion around Londoners' views about sensors and the trust they have about data sharing. And some interesting conclusions. There are some very strong opinions, but there are also some very pragmatic opinions from citizens. I will share my data if I know it's going to be used for some good, supporting the NHS or uh, improving yeah. transport. But I want you that to, communication I want, I again, want isn't to know it? what you're going to do with it. Yeah. But on the other hand, and I think this is a really interesting thing, thing that we've found. When we've mobilised, we're mobilising this thing called the Violence Reduction Unit at the moment to tackle knife crime uh, in London. And when we talk to um, working class uh, or deprived communities in London about the impact of knife crime and we talk to them about data, mm. there is really low trust about data because the data that they receive is this school has decided on this set of data to exclude your child. Yeah. It's, a, it's a means of control mm. and some data used by some agencies in some communities is not trusted. So now how do you, how do you shift that? Though? Yeah, well, exactly. So that doesn't percolate through to number crunches somewhere going like, isn't this really interesting? There's a correlation between exclusions and knife crime. It's like that only tells you part of the story. That data should open up conversations with community groups and professionals and citizens to have a deeper conversation. <laughs> it is not the answer. It's an entry point into the beginning of a discussion. And that takes us from data into design. And design should be part of democracy. How we create new ways of stopping bad things happening should be designed with the citizen, augmented with data, and public service professionals, and using the best talents of the tech community. That's, I, I think, where we... Is that your vision? To, Is that where you want us to, to get to, to, to as a city? That's where we need to get to. Mm. And by the way, we're not saying you should trust governments with your data. I mean, for me, it's pretty important to say that we are betting on a model where citizens themselves can, can control their own data. I mean, in fact, you know, the biggest project that I mentioned before, the Decode, is a decentralized privacy enhancing architecture for data sovereignty for citizens, mm -hmm. where it's the citizens that decide what data they want to keep private, and then we do cryptographic enhancement. I mean, we do actually training on cryptography for people and public officials, what data they want to share, with whom, and on what terms. And the terms of sharing the data should be accountable and transparent. So we are shifting the power to the citizens yeah, the and then right say way. cities and public administration can be the custodians of citizen digital rights and enable that yeah. to happen. So rebalance the power in the digital economy, a new social pact on data. Is that the same in New York? Is it is a citizen at the heart of it or you still got some way to go on? Yeah, I mean, that's bearing the power. Yeah, I think the crisis of trust that they're talking about is, is a global phenomenon. Yeah. Um, definitely when it comes to smart cities, certainly I think, um, you know, the average New Yorker hasn't really seen how do, how do they benefit? How does technology benefit my everyday life? That's, that's, first, that's, that's the most important thing. But not only on, in smart cities, I think we're seeing, um, you know, breaches of trust in healthcare applications, uh, in financial services. So, so there's, there's, from an economic development perspective, there's also, uh, you know, a crisis potentially of innovation because this can set us back 10 years if we stop innovating because we don't know how to execute right with the uh, resident and, and people, at, at people at the center. There was a, um, a research uh, study by the Pew Center last year that uh, talked about how only 25% of Americans believe that tech companies can be trusted to do good most of the time, and only 3% believe that tech companies can be trusted to do good just about always, uh, only 3%. So, you know, we need to change that. And when I started at the beginning with, you know, what are the things that need to happen for technology um, and inclusive economic growth to continue to succeed in New York, I think it's about people seeing themselves in those jobs and it's about working in a public-private partnership to um, really demonstrate how technology can be a force for good. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the last thing I would say is the EU, and the UK, I think, have taken you know a leadership role when it comes to uh, you know building trust uh, with pioneering legislation around privacy. 
From a US perspective, there's no federal approach right now, but the conversation is very much happening. We're starting to see a patchwork of legislation advancing in California, in New York. Um, what we're doing from a city perspective, um, you know, in, a, in an economy like New York, that it's really a macroeconomy and the size of, of, of many yeah. um, European countries, is, um, is investing in federating a lot of what's already happening in New York, mostly driven by the private sector and academia, and involving uh, the civic community. So last month we issued a call for expressions of interest for um, the New York City Center for Responsible AI, which will be a physical place that will act as a pre-regulatory sandbox where our companies um, and our citizens and government can bring commercial applications and government pilots and have a societal conversation about how do we address issues of fairness and accountability and explainability and, and all of these issues so as to inform the regulatory conversation that's happening. And that's, so that's going to be open as well, isn't it? To that, that's open uh, through August, yeah. and uh, it, it's really exciting. Uh, if you're interested, go, go check it out on, on the website. Um, and, you know, I'm excited to be here because Europe is, is playing such a leadership role and we'd love to build bridges and partnerships so that we can elevate cities and, and the regions that are, you know, driving this work. No, thanks, Anna. And I think going back to Catherine's point earlier, I think... I don't think any of us can underestimate the need to keep communicating because I think you're all driving these most incredible agendas. Um, it is a force for good. It's technology for good. And I know, Theo, you launched Lottie last night. Do you want to just explain a little bit what you're doing with the London Councils? So, because we need to bring all the boroughs with us as well, don't we, with this yeah, adoption? So, so, so we launched the London Office of uh, Technology and Innovation, which is effectively a, um, a function that will bring together the councils that have got the hunger for digital transformation. I'm not saying others don't, but they don't feel quite ready at the moment. It's not a ma massive priority for them. It's going to be led by Eddie Copeland from Nesta, starting off with 15 councils in London. Um, that's quite a significant number. If you put them together, that puts it in the kind of top 10 European cities, just 15 London councils. Um, and wow. uh, Camden being one of them, we are in Camden yes. right now. Um, and it will focus on that uh, capacity building. Um, but just reflecting on the, on the points that we were making together about cities, so when we capacity build in Lottie, we'll be able to do things that I think are really, really important for innovation in London. Mm. Um, because of a number of sort of well-publicized examples about the application of artificial intelligence, for example, usually from the United States outside of New York. Um, <laughs> but um, <coughs> there, there have been challenges about the um, consequences of introducing technologies that aren't properly, properly understood when they are procured. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be working, and we're already working through the... Um, the coalition that uh, Francesca mentioned with the city of Helsinki on creating a kind of democratic framework for the deployment of new technologies. So instead of, um, you know, at the moment, quite a lot of people, including companies, are putting out, you know, we need a code for AI, um, and the principles are so high level, they don't actually become that useful when you're applying things in practice. Mm -hmm. But we think that if you're deploying a piece of technology in a city, what you need to do is create those questions that public officials can ask of that technology, create that discussion and paper trail, and make it more transparent to mayors and leaders of councils and cabinet members and so on. Mm. And that's kind of one of the things that we think will come out of the London Office of Technology and Innovation, of just sitting down there and just sitting, sitting around and just kind of going, what are the key things that we need to know about this process and this technology that's being deployed? And I think the important part of this is that we're shaping this approach with other European cities, other cities uh, across the world as well, because everybody's facing the same challenge. And if we can do that and create some sort of level of understanding of what we need from this, that I think is a tremendous boost to the market because they can understand the terms by which we treat. Hmm. And that's really important. I mean, also cities can experiment bottom up. I think this is the added value. The thing is, I, I think you shouldn't be afraid of regulation. I mean, actually, usually people here tend to say, oh, no, you know, don't let the government regulate. They're going to do it bad and late and it doesn't 
you know, it doesn't serve the purpose. Well, I think you yeah. can have very good regulation. I mean, look at the GDPR. The problem is that you want some uh, governance framework around data, but you want ways to implement it. Like, it shouldn't be just a checklist for lawyers, you know, or, or like people that do, you know, process uh, around ethics or like ethics greenwash. That's not what it's supposed to be. It should be implemented. To be implemented, you know, you need privacy enhancing technologies, you need to invest in infrastructure, in knowledge, in skills, uh, you need to have an ecosystem that can generate markets which are based around those principles, and governments sometimes can regulate very well. So I'm confident, I mean, I'm confident Europe will actually regulate on AI, sorry to say, but you know, I was in Germany quite a bit, and I think there is this idea also because for Europe, information, self-determination, privacy, data protection are fundamental rights of citizens, so they are entrenched in the constitutional framework. It's very important to be able to have a regulatory framework that can lead into a more um, kind of people-centric digital world, you know, where we don't risk to be completely, um, to, to lose trust yeah. in our society. So I think we will see more regulation, but at the same time, experimentation, show what works, what doesn't, what we can do with real projects, get to people with concrete applications and tools and scale it to concrete problems, you know? I think this is what makes cities we really well positioned to lead in this space. So I'm conscious of time, but I'm going to e ask each of you very, very quickly, like one sentence. Um, COGEX is committed to be in this part of London, I think, for the next three years, which is excellent. Um, if we were sat here three years from now, it's not very far away. Um, what's the one thing that you would like to see in your city that has, or you, could cho you can choose any city, Catherine, um, that's changed as a force for good through technology? Well, for our work, it's just um, more, I would say in a word, collaboration, and we've touched on it. I think it would be um, wonderful to see this chief digital officers, chief innovation officers, data officers, whatever they're called, have some kind of a, a network sharing ideas in a more robust way. It's happening, it's starting to happen more. There yeah. are some organizations that are addressing it, but that's something that would really make a difference, sharing ideas. Thanks, Catherine. I'm sure we can get there in three years. Anna? For me, for me it's about uh, traditionally underrepresented demographics, having a seat at the table, in the discussions about experimentation and definitely in designing these products and using these products. We have made over the last uh, four or five years very intentional investments across K through 12, introducing computer science education to all kids in New York City, which yeah. is you know, turbocharging the next generation of talent as well as the public university system. And so I would like to see those investments bear fruit in really seeing those kids in tech, in tech jobs that they wouldn't otherwise uh, been able to access. Fantastic. I'm completely with mm. you on that. Yeah. I think for me it's about showing that cities can be a place for new democratic politics. So I think we are seeing more and more cities that are becoming green, that are becoming democratic, feminist, I mean kind of leading this new positive revolution that we really need. And if you see like for instance in Europe, uh, cities are pretty progressive, they have female yeah. leaders. Uh, I think the energy transition and fight against climate change for me is like top priority. Yeah. We need to show that we can uh, take back public space, we have to re-green our cities, regenerate our cities, we have to create the infrastructure and condition to do this energy transition, decarbonize the economy, so much it will happen in cities. And I think that technology really is absolutely yeah, crucial for that, not absolutely. only to monitor, to lay out the new infrastructure, Structures, yeah. the digital infrastructure, and then data sovereignty, giving back control and ownership of data to people, and then have the right rules. Uh, so data, I mean, data on, on governance as a human right. I think this is what we're Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. Thank you, Francesca. Theo, three years from now, what's the biggest change that we've made in well, London? Personally, I'd say remaining in Europe. <laughs> 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 I, th I think I think Steve agrees with me. Um, the, uh, <laughs> but I, I think I think, irrespective of that, our ability as European cities to work with fellow European cities and being bold on together, yeah, um, uh, on data, 
um, on innovation uh, to essentially harness technology for civic benefit. And the big challenge over the next three years is, uh, is essentially around leadership and trust. To say to people, we have lots of your data, we have partnerships with third parties, mm. you can trust us, here are some mechanisms which help us do that. And I think there is tremendous, tremendous potential to take action on climate change, to reduce congestion, to improve air quality, to improve skills uh, and talent, if we can do that. But it takes real commitment from our political leaders and real commitment to designing those safeguards that we've talked about today. Absolutely. I think that I think there's three common um, threads throughout this conversation. Trust. That's come out so strongly, I think you all agree. Um, the cities that are really driving this change um, and collaboration. I think it's fantastic to hear how much our cities are collaborating. Um, and I know we're running out of time, but I know we started with a bit of a fun fact. And I just want to ask you one. We're part of London Tech Week, everybody, as you probably know. COGX has chosen to sort of host this as part of London Tech Week, where we've got 55,000 delegates with 7,000 from all over the world. And I just want to ask each of you, when you're sort of crazily running around, flying into London, uh, Theo lives in London. Should stop flying, no? Yeah. Oh, you're a star yeah. in London. Um, I'm going to ask you, what's the one place you like? What's your favourite place in London? Oh, my God. <laughs> favourite. <laughs> yeah. That's like, yeah. That's I'm going to start with Theo. I'll give yeah. you time to think okay. about it. Well, this is, your, this is my new favourite place, everybody. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, actually, it's King's Cross. I was a Camden <laughs> councillor for 15 years. I know oh. what King's Cross was like 15 years ago. Bagley's. And I think they've done a tremendous job basically integrating the new King's Cross it, as a new quarter in London. And who would have thought 15 years ago that we'd be having a conversation about AI in ethics? <laughs> in here, like, in the tube. Yeah. I love it, I love it. Francesca, if you were like, well, you were I mean, celebrating, I, you've been successful in climate change and you've come to celebrate with your friends. In where London. do you go? Well, I, you I, go? I mean, I lived in Hackney and Dalston for almost eight years, so I love East London. You go <laughs> celebrating in East London. And Anna? Um, you know, you catch me there. I mean, I lived here almost 17 years ago in Notting Hill, and, um, but I don't know that I would, yeah, yeah, that's still good, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I have to say last, last year I was here uh, for London Tech Week as well, and I visited King's Cross because it is an incredible project, uh, and building over rail yards is something that uh, I guess our cities tend to do. So, so that was interesting, but I have to say my favorite place is my sister's house uh, in, um, in Brixton, so. Uh, oh, Brixton, that's, that's well, the place I go Brixton. to. Nice. Cool. Catherine, you've lived here many it, years as well. Yeah, and it's changed. It's, it's incredible. What's your favorite, favorite little spot? Well, I, I have to say, well, I mean, the new spot, you know, the Bloomberg office is pretty incredible. Uh. <laughs> so, you know, I used to like the old office, which was in Finsbury <laughs> Square, but the new one is pretty fabulous. Pretty but I, too, I love Notting Hill. My favorite restaurant, I went there last night, is in Notting Hill, so I always go back. But we're now, through our work with the City of London, we're spending a lot of time in the Olympic mm. Park site, so seeing how East London is expanding and booming is just heartwarming. Fantastic. Well, please join me in thanking our fantastic panel.